Right. Okay. Well, it is two o'clock, so uh, we are going to kick off our session. Um, welcome, everybody, and thanks for joining us. Um, we've had a great time so far on Shine Connect. This is our Shine Connect lockdown edition. It's the first time in five years we've done an online conference. And we are really grateful today to be joined by Professor Sir David Spiegelholzer. Um, and David is chair of the Winton Center for Risk and Evidence Communication at the University of Cambridge. Um, you may have seen him on TV or heard him on the radio. Certainly there was a period of time a few weeks ago where every time I turned on Radio 4, he was there talking about um, numbers and stats. Um, he's a fellow of the Royal Society. He was knighted in 2014 for services to medical statistics, and he has a best-selling book called The Art of Statistics. So um, I'm feeling slightly intimidated, but uh, oh, there's the book. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect stocking stuffer for Christmas, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so David, I am going to hand it over to you. Um, if anyone does have any questions as we go along, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we will ask them as we go. Um, we've got David for an hour and he is going to be talking to us about how we can understand stats and whether a bacon sandwich is going to kill us um, or you know, how many avocados we need to eat. So thank you, David, for joining us. Over to you. No, great pleasure, great pleasure. I had avocado for lunch. I hope it's not going to kill me. Anyway, um, yeah, no, real pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me to to join this. And um, well, we've got an hour. Um, I, I've got some slides prepared, and I can talk about stats, you know, forever and ever. But I don't just want to give a lecture. There's no point in me doing that. So um, or, what I'd like to do is I'll I'll I'll, I'll chat about some stuff. Um, and probably for about 20 minutes or so. And then I'll take a break and I hope people are asking some questions and then I can go on to other things. So basically, I've got general stuff about stats, I've got stuff about COVID, and then I've got some funny things to end with. So I've got to fit in the funny things to end with before, but I'll do those at the end. Um, so that's how, if that's okay, that's how I'll go. But please send in questions, anything to do with stats, and I shall do my best to answer them. But just let's start off um, by uh, me sharing my screen and um, I will try to then um, yeah making sense of it's um, I'll share my my images pretty awful title I realize making sense of statistics but it's very nice of you to join when it, when I give such an awful title to, for a talk but never mind um, just to say just to give a, a you know a heads up to oh sorry um, oh my thing isn't, doesn't seem to be working oh I know I've got to turn it off let's see if I can get my clicker to work Okay, great. Um, that, that, I work with a lovely team of people in Cambridge. This is um, uh, from the last year, so they changed a bit, but um, largely psychologists and things. So although I'm a statistician, I work in the maths department, although I'm formally retired now, so much of my work is with psychologists and I'll talk about, and designers, and I'll talk about that later. Um, uh, what I have done is, you know, over the last 10 years, so I've done a lot of communication work I mean any of your wipeout fans I did do the big red bulls you know in 2011 and got on quite well I could even show you some of that if you re if we're really stuck for content <laughs> um, but maybe you're not wipeout fans but I was and so I got on the program uh, okay um, uh, the reason I want to do this practically is uh, th this is my son Dan Spiegelhalter and he had retinoblastoma you know as a, as a genetic cancer eye cancer and which he had nuts when he was five years old and he had radiotherapy and went through all of that business so that's all rather familiar to me and i'll, I'll come on to my <laughs> history a bit later okay then what i'd like to say is that uh, data does not speak for itself it, it, it sounds a cliche but you know people kind of think that oh if we've got lots of data it'll somehow tell us all its answers and no that is a complete delusion don't believe anybody who says that and this is a lovely quote in from my book um, uh, from Nate Silver, The Signal and the Noise, good book. Um, it says, the numbers have no way of speaking for themselves. We speak for them. We imbue them with meaning. And that means that whenever we hear numbers, we have to be really careful what kind of meaning other people are giving to them. Uh, as I said, you, numbers, I can make a number, any number look large or small, frightening or reassuring. That's just part of my, the skills that one picks up. And I'll show you some of those tricks as we go along. Um, but it does mean we really is incumbent on us to think carefully whenever people are throwing numbers at us. And I just want to talk about some tricks for dealing with that. 
Okay, so um, I know, <laughs> you know, I, someone collected these wonderful Daily Express headlines. This is just from a short period of one year. Can you look at all those things? Processed food cancers danger. Yogurt stops heart attacks. That's one of my favourites. And um, you can tell the huge number of ones about you know Alzheimer's, arthritis, dementia. Yeah, you know, it shows the age of the people that the Daily Express is being aimed at. Busy roads can cause dementia, or you know, eat curry to beat dementia. That's a cool one. So we're bombarded with that stuff all the time. Now, of course, we're bombarded with COVID headlines, but pre normally we get this sort of stuff all the time. And, um, and this is something that we really need to um, be able to be wary of. So here's an example. This is what can happen to a respectable scientific study by largely, in this case, by the press release. This was a uh, particularly um, boring uh, Scandinavian study, socio-economic position and the risk of brain tumor. Okay, so what they said, okay, in the abstract, this is scientists, language, we observed consistent associations between higher socio-economic position and higher risk of glioma. So what they really mean, richer people got diagnosed with more brain cancers, is what they sort of said. Well, by the time we got to the press office, they want to make it a bit more readable. They can't use that language. So they said high levels of education linked to heightened brain tumor risk. Now, the paper wasn't about education particularly, but they obviously thought that was a slightly more interesting story to go with. And I, th I hope you can guess what's going to happen. By the time we get to the Daily Mirror, what do we get? But why going to university increases the risk of getting a brain tumor. And by this time, through this series of whispers, it's, got, it's lost all credit, you know, track of what the paper was actually about. You know, it, you know it's, it's saying it, it's causal. The, the uh, education is causing the brain tumors in some way. What? Why? Why? Rather than it's just a link. And there are two other reasons. And if, I, if you were in a live audience, I'd be asking you, I'd be stopping and asking you, but I won't do it now. Just think for yourself. Two other reasons why richer people might get diagnosed with brain more brain tumors anyway just and and it's not actually very interesting uh, okay the first one is that richer people live longer and so have got more chance to have a brain tumor now the authors did allow for that the analysis can adjust what's called adjusting for age so that's not that's not something that might explain this but and you might be able to think of the other one richer people get better health care they're much more likely to be diagnosed with a the disease. They're much more likely to seek investigations. And so that could be an artifact that could lead to the bigger diagnostic rate. Okay, so it's not actually much of a story, but look at the headline. Okay, another thing to watch out for, apart from the, the, the headline, misleading headline, is what you can call positive or negative framing. And a classic example, of course, is that in, in the US, 2% uh, of people having heart surgery die um, from the heart surgery. Whereas in the UK, 98% of people survive. Ah, oh, it which sounds better. They're exactly the same, but it sounds better to talk about survival. And actually we use that, I wouldn't say trick, we use that later on, which I'll come on to. Okay, here's a really nice example I like. Um, this was the 99% uh, campaign it was called. And it said 99% of young Londoners do not commit serious youth violence. So, was, you know, you can see it's on big posters around London. Okay, what you're not supposed to do is what I did when I saw that poster. I took a picture of it and then I stood there and I thought, I thought, well, let's change it to a negative frame. Okay, so that means as a negative frame, it's a, it means that 1% of young Londoners do commit serious youth violence. Now, that's, then I can make it the number look even, make it look big by saying, well, what does that correspond to in terms of numbers of people? And in fact, there's about 8 million people in London, uh, young, if we call young between 15 and 24, there's about a million, there's about a million young people in London. Now, 1% of a million is 10,000. Oh my goodness me, there's 10,000 young maniacs roaming the streets of London, according to that poster. This is really terrifying. So um, I, I, yeah, again, the numbers do not speak for themselves. I can, we can make a number look reassuring or frightening, depending on how the story, what story we tell. And don't get me onto 350 million pounds on the side of a bus, although I will talk about that if you want me to. Okay, so there's, there's the trick. If you want to make a number look big, switch it to a negative frame and change it to numbers of people. 
So there's two tricks. I'm, I'm not suggesting you should do it, but watch out if somebody else is doing. So the, the, the crucial thing is then, if you, as I said, numbers can be made look large or small. If you do hear a number, it's very important to try to translate it into something that's meaningful, to do it per person or for me or for my family or for, or for a group of people I can imagine, like a hundred people. We, we can just about imagine a hundred people. So this is a standard, I wouldn't say trick, because it's so, it is the right thing to do. <laughs> um, now, let's look at, um, you know, we already heard about the killer bacon sandwich story. This is a standard one that comes out very regularly. This is from The Sun. Sean Wool is an excellent journalist. It's a good article, but the headline is awful. Um, rasher of bacon a day is deadly. Well, let's check that headline, shall we? I should explain always that the people who write the headlines in newspapers are not the people who write the stories. Um, the headlines go in after the journalists have gone home. The sub-editors put the headlines on, and sometimes they bear very little resemblance to the story underneath. I spend my time complaining about headlines um, related to things I've, uh, interviews I've had with journalists. Okay, so what does this actually relate to? It relates to a study that said 25 grams of processed meat a day is associated with a 19% increased risk of getting bowel cancer. Right. What does that mean? I mean, come on. Does this mean kill a bacon sandwich? What does it mean? Okay, we, a, a few steps we've got to do. What's 25 grams of processed meat a day? Well, 50 grams of processed meat is about three rashers of bacon. That's about a rasher and a half of bacon or a small sausage. So this is like a big bacon sandwich about every other day. So three or four big greasy bacon sandwiches a week. Well, let's say um, the 150 or you know, 200 a year. Uh, bacon sandwich, about 200 bacon sandwiches a year. Okay, 19% increased risk of bowel cancer. This is known as a relative risk, and it is a manipulative way to communicate a risk. It's known to exaggerate the apparent effect. Oh, this risk is doubled. Oh, well, that must be important. No, it's not necessarily important because doubling not very much is still not very much. So what we always have to ask is 19% extra of what on top of what? We need absolute risks. These relative risks, the percentage increase, are hopeless for communication. We need to know absolute risks. And in this case, they don't tell us in the story. We have to go to another source. And I always go to Cancer Research UK for the statistics about cancer. Excellent, excellent resource there on their website. And they tell me that about 6% of people will get bowel cancer anyway in their lives. So what we're talking about, if you're a heavy bacon eater, is a 19% increase over six percentage points. Now, that, I'm not going to test you, ask you to do that, but I don't know any journalist who can do this calculation on their own without help. We've actually written a whole app now called Real Risk that will do all this for you if you, if you are a journalist or a, um, a uh, press officer um, because people just can't do it. Um, but there is a method of dealing with this and communicating it that has been shown in multiple research studies to be extremely effective. And that's the idea of what we might call expected frequencies. And that basically means, what does it mean for 100 people, 100 average people? That's all we have to think about. And suddenly it all becomes straightforward. So here's 100 average people, you know, I don't know, smug middle class people eating their, you know, what is it? What are they eating? Their raisins and their berries and their nuts and their granola in the morning. Um, so sadly, uh, 6%, 6 out of 100 of those will get bowel cancer during their lifetime. Let's compare it, compare it with 100 other people who three or four times a week sit down to that for breakfast, a great big greasy three rasher bacon sandwich stuffed in their gob, and that's how many get bowel cancer. You notice there's one extra? That's the 19% relative increase over the six percentage points. So 100 people are going to have to eat that 200 times a year for the whole lifetimes to get one extra case. And that works out at, oh, gold, 100 times 20,000 each over, oh, 20,000 a year. Let's say they live for 50 years in their adult life. It's a million. So a million, people are going to have to eat a million of those damn things for one extra case of bowel cancer, which might make you think, okay, it makes me think, past the brown sauce. Now, I, I, it has actually maybe cut down on my bacon, but I still have it as a treat. Okay, so that's the sort of thing we can go through. And as I said, we've got a, 
uh, an app called Real Risk now that will do these calculations for journalists. Hopefully, might lead them to do better communication. <laughs> and amazingly, I love this. Just a few weeks later, same journalist, same story, same data, totally different headline. These boffins, and it was a different group of boffins, said now, oh, we're not going to say bacon's dangerous or killer. So this made the front page of the sun by then. I mean, this, this is the sort of thing that gives science and statistics a bad name, unfortunately. Okay, um, I'd like to talk about something that's more serious now, which is what we're doing on communicating the potential benefits of treatments to uh, women newly diagnosed with breast cancer. So, so in the, this is a more serious stuff, then we'll get on to the funny stuff later. Okay, so um, we've, with all my colleagues, psychological friends, web designers have put a front end on this PREDICT tool, um, which is for, originally started off for doctors, but now patients are using it themselves to help, help patients and clinicians see how different treatments for early invasive breast cancer might improve survival rates. And um, I could go online and demonstrate it, but I'll, I'll just get clicked through some slides. Um, you click on it and you fill in um, your details of what your clinical details. So this, just the basic stuff, your, your age, um, tumor size, 20 millimeters, tumor grade two, detected by screening, two positive nodes, et cetera, et cetera. And what treatments you're being considered for. And we're assuming this woman is being treated, considered for all treatments. And this is the absolute raw data. This is what the doctors wanted as their main summary, because they use this in the multidisciplinary team meetings when they're just thinking together of what treatment they might recommend to the woman. And so this says that um, for surgery alone, we'd expect someone this age, um, that there's people of this age, 46% of them would live another 15 years. In other words, till they're 80. So about half would live to their 80. And, and that includes both dying from breast cancer and dying from other things. With hormone therapy, we would expect that rate to go up to 54%. With chemotherapy on top, up to 61%. With trastuzumab, Herceptin, up to 65%. And bisphosphonates, up to 67%. And rather importantly, <clears throat> if we could, in a way, guarantee the woman was cured and she wouldn't die of breast cancer, it would only go up to 76% because C65 and, um, you know, on average, 76% of 65-year-olds will reach 80 Okay, so that's what that's the raw presentation. But what the research shows is that there's there's no single best way of communicating this. Um, there's uh, so we we could we <laughs> use every method we can think of to show. So we actually show survival curves, which some of you may be familiar of, which is saying for years after surgery, what percentage of women will be alive, and this is the percentage that will be alive um, if you could guarantee they wouldn't die from breast cancer. In other words, um, you know, so anything up here, sadly, is deaths from other causes. And then this is if for surgery only. And all these are the benefits from these extra treatments. So, you know, most of the, a lot of the slack, about two thirds of the slack, because you, know, you can't get above this, no matter if we guarantee the cure, we couldn't get above this. Uh, most of the slack is taken up with the treatments. Now, of course, we don't know the side effects of the chemotherapy in particular might be so strong that this wouldn't be advised. Um, but this puts it in perspective that 100 women taking chemotherapy like this, taking chemotherapy, six more would be alive after 15 years. Okay, we use a, a stacked bar chart. This is often misunderstood. This is the one I like least, but showing how the, the extra uh, benefits occur at 15 years. And we could go to five or 10. We put it in text and just what does it mean for 100 women? And then we show the little icons. Um, we don't show little people. Um, research showed that we didn't, people didn't like the little women. I mean, they much preferred just abstract blobs. And they also didn't like when we had these as big black blobs. These are people dying from other causes. You know, there's nothing we can do about that, really. Sorry, you know, people do. We're all, we're all gonna leave the world at some point. Um, but uh, we, we, we don't highlight that particularly. Um, and these are essentially the lives saved at 15 years by the different treatments. Okay, so um, this is found, this is used by uh, about 30,000 women a month now. It's been used by a million women so far. We've got a version for prostate, and I'm particularly interested in this because I've had uh, locally advanced prostate cancer, and I've had surgery and radiotherapy. So I am particularly interested in this one. Um, uh, this one also includes 
which I like and which we haven't got in, in the breast cancer yet, the side effects. Um, and in terms of incontinence, in terms of erectile dysfunction, and in terms of uh, bowel, you know, pretty long-term bowel dysfunction as well. So this says that um, the, after three years, um, how many out of 100 would be still be wearing pads uh, for incontinence? And uh, so about 20% if you have the radical surgery, radiotherapy, about 3% conservative management less. And so it gives you an idea of what the you know, fairly long-term serious side effects will be of the treatments. Okay, so um, we, we think this is rather good and it's very popular and attractive. It, I, I'm happy to talk about this in practice because the trouble, one of the problems is that people start trusting it too much. And they think these numbers that it comes up with are somehow, you know, we've got a given truth. And we have to emphasize that when this is given, this is not your risk. We never say this is your risk or this is the woman's risk. It's not. It's just an estimate of what we would expect to happen on average to 100 people who tick the same boxes as you. And you know, you don't tick many boxes. You don't know, we don't know about general health and sex. We don't know, actually, we don't even put in um, other factors that might affect um, the, the, the treatments and the side effects. So it's only a ballpark figure. There'll always, when any, anyone's discussing any medical treatment and they quote some statistics, they can quote that these are averages and they may be kind of refined to, to you, but there's always extra individual factors that are unique to you that might move those up or down. However, what, are, what we say is these risks are stratified. They're not personalized. They cannot be ever personalized, but they are stratified to a group of people who resemble you in some or a person or an individual to, to a, some extent. And they can give a useful ballpark, but they are not the truth. You've got to be careful not to over-trust them. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. I will just, just before I pause then, I will just talk about, um, actually, no, I'm going to pause now to see if there's any questions. And then we could talk a bit about COVID risks if people feel like it. But um, let me just uh, have I stopped? I've stopped sharing the screen. Yeah. Okay. Let me just stop now and answer any questions on that. And then we could go on to some covid -y stuff if people would like to. Sure. So first of all, David, I have to mention there are some questions about your time on Wipeout. So um, we'll get to those at the we'll end. We'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there, are some wipeout, there are some Wipeout fans out there. Oh, great. There are, there's more than one from oh, what I can wonderful. see. So. Well, I might just, if you're really good, I might just show you a little clip of my performance. So, so. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, maybe that'll be the grand finale then yeah, today. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think it's really interesting. And I think, you know, when you're a cancer patient, one of the things that ha happens is you are bombarded with statistics right and and you I think no. it depends some people you can go either way you can be the kind of person that just ignores them um, or yep. you can do a deep dive into them I know in my own case you know I became a bit obsessed actually yeah. with what yeah. the statistics were and yep. um, I think what you were talking about in terms of you know the risks being on average they're not personalized yeah. um, that can be a really difficult thing for people to accept yeah. i think so yeah. how can we how can we convey that to people and then give I, them a sense that you know their life isn't determined by the statistics yeah exactly well i i, I sort of speak for myself you know when i got my diagnosis i looked at st statistics and you might think that i would obsessively trawl through the literature and study no no i don't no i'm not that I'm not that interested. I, my disease is not my hobby. I, I, do, I did do some research, mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm so used to using medical papers uh, that I can, in a way, treat them with a certain degree of caution um, because they might, be, they might be old, they might be in America, they might be somewhere. You know, I, I, you, the amount to which they actually apply to you is quite limited. And, that's, and, and even this predict program we've got which is very good and it's based on uk data as recent as we can but as i said it still only gives a ballpark figure but even that can be very useful indeed to get a feeling for are we talking about a tiny benefit of the treatment are we talking about a big benefit of the treatment and so on and so yeah. i i do think this is a very valuable thing to do but what i i would what i didn't do myself i don't think or I don't, and I'm not sure I would recommend other people to is to become obsessed with, you know, what are the num what are the numbers to the three decimal places because they're, they're just not there, and you never know, and you are unique. And there's all sorts of factors that um, we we were designing I, something I um, 
you know, I really learned is that we were designing a, a, a website for parents of children with congenital heart disease to inform them about the risks. And one of the, and this is a you know really serious condition with, um, and we had to in a way communicate the fact that at surgery uh, some babies would not survive, and and yet we couldn't say exactly who would or who who wouldn't, and we couldn't use you know technical terms like random variation or you can't use luck or fortune although actually sometimes the idea you know fate all these terms that i you know i that we think about for ourselves when we don't know about our future we you know we we construct all sorts of stories about what might influence those um and so we were struggling with well, what term can we use for the fact that this is there's some unavoidable unpredictability about how different things might turn out for an individual and um uh, and we struggled with this. And then someone came up with this lovely phrase that we use now all the time, which is, we can't predict exactly what will happen to you because of um, uh, I, 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 un, unforeseeable factors. Mm -hmm. Unforeseeable factors. Not unforeseen, because that would suggest that somebody you know, should know. No, unforeseeable. That actually there are things that will influence what happens that we just cannot control ourselves. And so yeah. that therefore there's always a degree of absolute uncertainty about what might happen. So I got this little phrase, unforeseeable factors that rattles around in my head now. No, that's, <laughs> well, I know, and we have to, I think, just live with that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's interesting. I mean, I know we'll talk about COVID um, in a few minutes, but I yeah. think that's one of the things that you've seen the world grapple with, isn't it? <laughs> the oh, I, uncertainty yeah. Yeah. at the moment. I, 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 when... COVID has been a fantastic education to everybody about, about how little is known about so much and how the the inadequacies of modeling and the limitations of statistics and so on so it's been whereas we in the trade have known this forever <laughs> we, yeah. we've known how, how you know how, how little is known and how the statistics are often not very good and we don't know what's going to happen and so on. we're very familiar with that but to have that sort of exposed to the general public i think is very healthy but it is a bit of a shock i think for many people who absolutely the and i think amongst everything. I think amongst the shine community, there were quite a lot of people who kind of thought, well, I've been living with this kind of uncertainty for years. So, you know, yeah, kind of, yeah. you know, pull your socks up, people get used to it. Yeah, um, yeah. But we've had some really good questions come in. Let me I notice go... the numbers going up. I'm yes, not, they I'll are. Let, I'll let you, I'm not going to look at them. I'll let you uh, sort them. Okay. I so the one question that's come in is the, the predict tool that you mentioned, um, can it be used to see um, secondary or recurrence rates in cancer? Um, in a certain time period? At the moment, it's only got, got mortality in it. In it. Um, okay. We can, we've been thinking, we have got a, there is a model that would put in uh, disease-free survival, essentially. So it would just, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, look at the time um, until there was some, some recurrence, which of course would be lower because, you know, th that would happen um, earlier than, than the mortality. So that, that is, all those curves would drop down a bit and those would be curves for disease-free survival. Um, but we haven't got it in there yet. I, if, I, it'd be interesting to get feedback whether I, whether that would be a valuable thing. A lot of people do ask for that. The problem is you don't want to confuse them, so we'd probably have two different screens for that. Mm -hmm. because, um, it, it, you don't want to oh, put too much on at once. And so I, I personally would want to click, are you interested in mortality? Are you interested in all-cause mortality, which is what we also do. We don't just do breast cancer mortality, we do all-cause and or um, disease-free survival. Okay. That's great, thank you. Another question we've had, um, and this is gonna bring out the professor in you. Um, would it be possible to explain hazard ratio and confidence <laughs> intervals? Oh my God, well, it's <laughs> amazing. Oh, well, I didn't expect to ask this. I one. told you but people it just like shows, stats. No, it just shows the sophistication of, of an audience like this. And why it's so, such a joy to talk to an um, audience who, who are experienced patients and who are used to hearing this kind of stuff. Okay, hazard ratio basically is like, it's a relative risk of the bacon sandwich sort, um, mm -hmm. um, applied to a long-term follow-up of patients. So it's a basically a relative risk per year. So if you've got a hazard ratio of 1.5, it means your risk of the event, either the recurrence or the death, whatever, is 50% higher for every year that you're followed up. So it's essentially it's a relative risk per year, but it's over a unit of time. So it's always based on, on a long-term follow-up. A confidence interval, and we, we, we can put those on predict, it's basically the um, margin of error around one of these numbers that we put on um, that allows for the fact of the limitations of the size of the database, essentially. 
So uh, we can put, um, so that would be, if you've got a large database, those would be quite narrow, uh, big, a small database, it'll be, they'll be much wider. So they're there to do with the limitations of the amount of experience you've had for that in that particular situation. I, I, I think it's very important to put ranges on things. Yeah. Um, we argue about whether that should be the default or not. Uh, the default is just to give a single number. But. Okay, that's great. Great questions, yeah. wow. Yeah, oh, there's tons of really good ones. We, this one I really like actually. Um, so somebody has said, I've noticed obviously the majority of people in my cancer clinic are older than me, probably mm. by as much as 30 years. Yeah. So That's to what tough. extent is data on cancer oh. skewed by the age? Is there a lot of good data on cancer in young people? Yeah, How can well, we no, I this mean, the, the, the point is what I met, said is about the size of the database. The yeah. very rarity of some of these cancers means that there's, there's a lot of uncertainty about what might happen. And also, uh, possibly the, the rapidity of, um, you know, of changes in treatment means that just even looking at lo you know, historical data you know, from a long time back is not going to be very indicative of what's going on at the moment. Um, and so for various reasons, there will not be the quality of data, the extent of data for younger people. Um, it's also quite possible. And, but, you know, and so, for example, in, oh, I've got one to predict there's an explicit lower limit, age limit. So okay. you know, in general, you will make sure that the, any prediction, any model, um, any algorithm is, is very clear who it should be used on. Um, because going lower than that, um, it can produce different measures. And, and I'd like to show you in a moment a COVID risk calculator that has explicitly got in age by risk factor um, interactions because, uh, for example, you know, as I show, having cancer as a young person has got a much bigger effect on your COVID risk than having cancer as an older person, for example. Okay, great. So that, that so, kind of thing. Because yeah. I remember when, so I was diagnosed with cancer when I was 34. Um, and I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin lymphoma, which is a disease much more popular in the sort of 70 plus man. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I found it very hard to understand, okay, well, what does it mean for me when they say, you know, there might be 20 years survival yeah, and I think well that only takes me to 54. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah hang on that's not much. Yeah, yeah exactly whereas, I was whereas if, you're, longer. if you're my age you know you're 67 you think well whoopee that's pretty damn good. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it makes it really difficult. Yeah. Um, someone has also asked and this is about science communication so they yeah. said you've mentioned that headlines change all the time. Yeah. Um, do you think that this is due to poor communication or is there you know some kind of crisis in um the way that sci people think about science and um how they explain it yeah, does it no, undermine faith in science yeah i think it might so i mean you look at those ridiculous bacon sandwich stories i mean why would anyone take any notice of any of those headlines when they're changing every few weeks and it wasn't even as if the data had changed yeah. <laughs> it's just different boffins as i said no i think there is a real problem but that's a lot of the, the problem there is the media communication of science is that you know i would say that um, the only real scientific studies that should be given a high media profile are ones that are perhaps systematic reviews of the literature, where mm -hmm. people bring together what's known and produce a kind of fairly definitive statement about it, because those are not going to change rapidly. If every new study that somebody's done on possibly not very many people, they write a press release and it gets a big headline because it sounds cool and interesting. No wonder, and, and it might very well be in conflict with what people have heard before. And the problem is the very fact that it does go against what people have heard before means it's more newsworthy. And, and so the journalists go for it. Oh, I've got a, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not cynical, but I mean, do you know this story about Groucho Marx has got this lovely thing. He said, Oh, Groucho Marx said, I would never join a club that would have me as a member which is a lovely paradoxical statement. And I've got my Groucho principle for reading these health stories, these headline stories. The, the very fact that it's appearing in a newspaper is reason not to read it because mm. it's going to be newsworthy. It's going to be new. It's going to be different. It's going to go against the established um, understanding, which means it's almost certainly wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so I think, you know, a deep caution about the stuff that gets media coverage. Uh, and, and, so, and especially uh, and especially if it gets promoted on social media a real deep yeah. caution about that because you were talking i think it was really useful when you said you know if when you see those headlines can you translate it into thinking about 100 yeah. people yeah so would you recommend as well if you see those headlines maybe trying to look up 
where it's come from yeah or what the yeah, yeah. I, always, was. I, I, I always look you know look at i would say before even reading any content i want to go who's telling me this you know is it from a decent group is it is this from some pressure group is it from some you know unfortunately charities can be some of them well they've always got they've always got an agenda of course yeah. they have quite, quite rightly but it means charity statistics are sometimes a bit iffy to be honest so I, I look at where it comes from are they trying to persuade me of anything and then try to translate and say well is this a big number or not um, they're getting better this this message of what does it mean for 100 people um, that's appearing more and more in the scientific papers themselves and therefore into the the media um, so it's the message is getting through that this oh this double increases the risk by 80 percent is mm -hmm. a mean almost meaningless um you know a bit of communication yeah. okay we've got two other really good questions i would ask i mean there's tons but um and oh. then maybe we can go back to your slides yeah, i will go oh there's got all these questions coming <laughs> yeah, i'm just seeing the numbers i'm not trying to read them but uh, oh they're so lovely yeah um okay. so somebody's asked um if there was a one percent one to two percent decrease in a recurrence rate by taking a medication yeah. how can i look at look at that and sensibly weigh up oh. whether taking the medication is worth oh, it or not god what a fantastic question god that's so difficult um but, but, i mean <laughs> ah i mean this is <laughs> this is unbelievable and because this is what when you know women see something like predict or anything, this is what they 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 yeah. um they're faced with there are some rules of thumb for example um cambridge uh university hospitals um if the absolute 10-year risk in terms of mort all cause mortality the gain from chemotherapy is less than three percent they say don't take they don't recommend chemotherapy okay. because that would mean if it's less than three percent more than 30 women would have to have the chemotherapy which causes you know it can cause real harm for just one of them to be more to be alive at 10 years right if it's above six yeah. percent which it was six percent in the lady i i demonstrated this on if it's above six percent they really reckon they might they could very well recommend it in other words the the trade-off might be worth it between three and six would depend very much on on you know, on the woman and what she felt about what she might have to go through with the chemotherapy sure um, and that's we, where it comes down to individual preference it, it, it I think, absolutely as well, comes it? down there is this thing you know it's known as a preference zone you know if mm. uh, if there's a, a the difference is so big then I, I think most people would recommend well take the hit and and get the get the long term benefit, um, and many clinicians would would recommend that. If it's tiny, no, no one's going to recommend you know going through um, you know what possibly very severe side effects for that. But there is in between this preference zone, a grey area where um, I, you know absolutely right that patient preference should come in, and it is it's necessarily depends on individual feelings about about this. I, I would recommend um, trying to learn about what some of these potential side effects are like. There are good websites which will demonstrate what you know the effects of these things are. I found actually you know the side effects of my treatment they were there. Um, you know, I think I maybe I was quite lucky, but actually I wasn't that lucky. I got a severe infection. I was back in the hospital after the surgery for. <laughs> it's not that lucky. Yeah, it wasn't lucky at all. It was awful. I had an extra surgery I had to have anyway. So I wasn't at all lucky. But I, <laughs> um, but um, uh, I, it, I did find it useful to talk to other people in particular. Mm -hmm. It's something I did do. Uh, and, um, Which is something we try to do through Shine, yeah, obviously, yeah, and, and our networks. And, so. and I, I, I think the support group, uh, my my partner, who's a doctor, of congenital heart disease, thinks that the patient support group is the greatest medical advance in the last thirty years, <laughs> much more than any treatment or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's great thank you so this is a, this is the last question i'll ask you before we go back to yeah, your okay. but i really like this one so why does my brain over exaggerate the odds of getting a recurrence when i know that my chance of winning the lottery is so tiny because you're a human being and <laughs> <laughs> of course you know we're not good with numbers and magnitudes um and they don't really mean very much it's pe people's feelings and their their dread their anxieties always come into these judgments. So it's a, I mean, this, what Danny Kahneman said about thinking fast and slow, you know, we're all individuals in which we've got two ways of thinking. We've got our gut reactions, we've got our feelings, which are wonderful and great, and that's how we live. But we've also got, which I think is important, an ability to slow down and just try, try to think about magnitudes. And that's why I think that, you know, a little thing of 100 people showing there's only one dot there, 
you know, well, what if there's a 1% chance there's only one dot? Now, <laughs> you may be unlucky, but actually it's like throwing a dart at that board. If it hits that, your, that dot, then that's thing. But actually, you know, another way I think about it, I found useful, is to think of possible futures. That in the end, these 100 people, we could think of them as 100 ways things might turn out for us. You know, mm-hmm. there's a hundred possible futures, and we just don't know which which of these futures would go. We don't want to know. People don't want to know the future. People live with uncertainty all the time, and uh, some of those futures will turn out well. Some of them won't. Um, and the crucial thing is how many of them <laughs> are going to be really bad. And you know, if I do something, will I reduce the number of bad futures? But I can't reduce it to zero. And and so that's why again, why I think some sort of visual idea of magnitude: how many of these possible futures are okay, and how many are terrible, and how many are sort of in between. I find it a useful sort of psychological, um, you know, mm-hmm. process to go through. But I struggle with this. God, we all do. We're human beings, for heaven's sakes. We're not. We're not sort of robotic, rational creatures that can look at the numbers and suddenly decide, well, that's right, and et cetera, et cetera. No, we can't. Can I show you this COVID risk tool? I'm, I'm going to. Then we'll come back and I'll show you some. Do some laughs. I think. Oh, getting all these questions in chat is so lovely. But uh, I'd like to show you this. Um, Actually, I say I'm going to go on a website. I'm going to share the. Um, uh, oh, hang on, hang on. Where do we go? Let's go on to. Uh, oh, maybe I've messed this up. Just a moment. It's uh, all right. You've got lots of fans here. Yeah, well, they're good. No, but I don't want to miss. I want to actually show you this <laughs> online tool if I could find it. Um, Uh, yeah, okay. Now, that's the one I want to show you, this COVID mm-hmm. risk assessment, because it uses, um, okay, what I'm going to do now is open up this up on my screen and then try to share my screen and hope this works. If I go to here, I'm sorry about the, the amateurness here, um, but if I go, ah, oh, this is it. Okay, so this is this website, and I think this is by a respectable group of people. And it's actually for people going to work. And this is what it does is generate a chance of dying from COVID if you catch it. So it's essentially it's your vulnerability to COVID. It's based on the database of 17 million people They're collected in general practice. And so what you put in, so I can put in myself, I'm 67, oh, not 267, not quite. Yeah, and I'm male um, and I'm white and my BMI is actually, I'm, yes, I'm less than 30. Okay. And I haven't got any of this lot, other conditions. So we could, we got masses of things we can fill in. You know, we can put in transplants. We can put in all sorts of stuff. And interestingly, what it does, and I don't know what you think about this, it translates everything you put in, it gives you a COVID age. And it's actually normalized, unfortunately, I think, to white men like me, healthy white men. So I'm 67. I, I'm not putting in my cancer because I'm in rem- remission at the moment. Sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not putting in my cancer. So 67, and then they'll tell me, if I get, if I get the infection, the, the chance that I will die is between 4.7 per thousand and 19 per thousand. So that's from about um, half a percent to 2%. So, you know, it's probably roughly about one in a hundred chance. So think of a hundred people like me, if I get COVID, one of, in one of those futures, I would die, 99, I wouldn't. Which actually is quite high. It's about my chance of dying in the next year anyway of something else. And so that's why I'd like young people to keep away from me. Let's put, but remember that's COVID age of 67. Let's put in a younger person. Um, let's put in someone perhaps who's 35 or something like that um, and uh, is white, BMI 30. But let's put in a non hemological cancer diagnosed between one and five years ago. Now that, their age is 35, but having the cancer has added 20 years onto their COVID age. Wow. And this is based on the best evidence available. And so what that means is that somebody um, who's that age and has got a, a, a cancer, uh, you know, very, very roughly, has got the same risk as a 55-year-old white, healthy 55-year-old white man. So and it's some, sorry, someone's just asking a question. What is COVID age? Oh, well, that's what, it's this imaginary concept. It's the, um, COVID age is the, uh, risk for a healthy white man is the age of a healthy white man who's got the same risk as you that's it okay <laughs> yeah it's, it's an odd concept but um i know it's it sort of maps everybody onto the scale of healthy white men and what it means is your risk that your individual's risk 
just given these factors, on average, between 1.4 in 1,000 of 0.5. So between 1 in 1,000 and 5 in 1,000. So still less than 1 in 200. So the crucial thing is, is that that individual with their cancer has got extremely high risk relative to other 35-year-olds, but their absolute risk, if they get it, is still less than mine as a healthy 67-year-old. And what this shows is that age is massively important in, in COVID. It is a huge risk factor, age, if you, if you catch it. Um, and so this is freely available, and it's being used to, for recommendations about um, uh, under 50, oh, moderate risk. If you're between 50 and 69, your COVID age would be moderate risk. And I guess also then you've got to think about, well, what is your risk in general of catching COVID? Oh, yes. Yeah. Because this, is was... if you, this is if you catch it. Yeah. So, I mean, basically what it would say is that if you are uh, particularly of, um, of high risk, if your COVID age is above 70, either because you are above 70 yeah. <laughs> or you're younger and you've got some medical conditions, high risk, you, then you've got to take particular precautions. So what this is, is a kind of evidence-based or risk-based a criteria for for shielding or for you know protecting yourself or whatever it, it and it is the rather different from the current shielding list mm -hmm. so um i i don't know what people think about it. i quite like this idea how it works and you can go and have a go at it but it is a warning that you know this is a very rough um and um you know and it sort of can be um a bit worrying but actually with this audience your, this audience is used to hearing tough things, so um, I'm not so concerned. Well, yeah, I'm and concerned, I think I'm concerned about them, but yeah. I know this is an audience that's used to hearing very tough things. Yeah, <laughs> oh, oh, we someone just said we're already worry. professionals at worrying. Worry, I love that. Thank, <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, it's it's actually really it's so God, it's lovely talking to this audience. I love it. It really is delightful because. Um, uh, you know, because it, in a sense, this is a robust audience. Yeah. You know, I, I, I can speak in an honest and straightforward way with this audience. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Um, and like, yeah, like we were saying, it doesn't take into account your risk of catching COVID no. in general. So obviously no, that's higher I, I if you live in to, certain areas. No, I tend not to deal with the risks of, if, of, of catching it because that, that's so dependent on the environment, the, the people you mix with, you know, where you live, deprivation, and, you know, basically just your lifestyle, your behavior. Yeah. And that's a very, that depends on it or every individual. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that's really come up with COVID actually is people's like sort of tolerance for risk. So some people, you know, they were sort of happy going to restaurants or pubs yeah. once they yeah. opened, whereas other people went, yeah. no, I'm still not yeah, going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a phrase, it's called risk appetite, and um, you know, which okay. is a technical phrase that people talk about all the time, and, and companies have risk appetites. And things like that. So it's, it's quite a useful idea um, to have risk appetite, and because it does vary hugely among people. I've, I've been amazed. Mine... Well, I'm fairly cautious on the whole, I think. Um, I have, my risk appetite is not huge, um, but I've seen uh, many people who got you know, really none at all. You know, just, <laughs> and I think that's really tough because it means that you know, the, your life has so, become so constrained in this situation. So we've got another question here um, that says, um, fantastic talk thank you can advances in machine learning be used to improve the personalization of treatment and yeah. treatment risk oh that's very important very interesting i i'm still slightly suspicious of that um uh, because i mean machine learning is just clever more statistical techniques the stuff that's being used in predict is fairly old-fashioned sort of statistics but not bad at all and um people have tried using for on the sort of database that was used for predict tried using much more advanced neural network methods and it hasn't led to an improvement um i i feel that the real gain in machine learning and you know deep uh, deep network networks and so on is in a lot of that is in image recognition image processing in, in terms of automatic interpretation of signals and so on um, mm -hmm. I think that's enormously important to try to just look at a medical record a database and extract knowledge from it I think is extremely difficult partly because machine learning works best when there's a you know you've got a set of data and you've got a real clear outcome you know yes no bomb like that whereas Outcomes from, you know, cancer therapies and things you might not see for years, 
so you won't have seen for lots of stuff. It's it's much more the huge as as I say it is hugely dominated by unforeseeable factors. It's not just a yes. You can't just say this is going to be work or not work. There's so much other stuff that comes into it. Even with all these treatments, we still can only give a probability of things happening. And machine learning does not work so well as that. It's a highly this is a highly sort of probabilistic, uncertain environment to work in. As we know, we don't know what's going to happen. And to expect a machine to be able to tell you what's going to happen, I think, is very difficult. Great. Thank you. Someone else has asked, um, can you talk about the bias within population itself? And they gave an example. They say in rare cancers, there's so little data, cases are minimal. So how do we understand you know, the, the risks of getting those cancers, but also what it means for somebody who gets them? Yeah, it's very difficult because you may tend to get a very biased view by what is actually put up on you know, social media or even support groups and so on, because you're just getting the experience of certain individuals. And that's very difficult to judge then how representative that is and what it might mean for me. And that's why, of course, you know, statisticians always would try to get, you know, random samples or representative samples to give an idea of, uh, you know, it's all the time it's trying to get a, a slightly more accurate feeling of out of this hundred people, how many are bad and how many are good. That's basically it, you know, what you're trying to do. And if you're only hearing about the bad ones or only hearing about the good ones, you're not going to be able to estimate, um, you know, really what, what the prospects might be, how many possible futures might end up good or bad and so one has to be extremely cautious again any information you hear about why am I hearing this is this I'm only hearing this because the person wants to, me to hear this and are they do they want to make me either frighten me or reassure me and in either situation one needs to be very cautious about this and try to go for balanced trustworthy sources of information and that's why you know I think charities do have a fantastic role in trying to put together essentially the, the, the good and the bad. They're not just for trying to push, they're obviously concerned with the importance of the issue, absolutely mm -hmm. rightly, but they're not trying to make things out to be either fine or, or absolutely terrible. You know, they're actually trying to give a, a picture that does cover the, the whole experience. Yeah. yeah. But it, again, you know, it's almost buyer beware, just be cautious about the story and I always think of the motivation of the person who's doing the communication as I, said, I think that's a that's a great tip and when you said you know if it's made the news yeah <laughs> that yeah. that in itself should yeah. be enough for us to kind of and even why. you know even if stuff on social media is getting lots of likes and things like that that is the reason to be, be not to trust it <laughs> yeah and I you know I I'm on Twitter all the time I love things you know, I look at stuff that gets a lot a lot of tweets but you know, um, so I'm as susceptible to this as anybody else. But, I, you know, you have to be careful. You do have to be careful. So we've got um, another question here. We've got about five minutes left. But somebody has said, I have no uh, idea I wonder, what this I do is. Want to show the, I want to show the oh. wipeout video, but it's only three minutes. Okay, we can fit that in definitely. Yeah. Why don't we take this as a last question? Somebody, Claire, has asked, can you explain Simpson's paradox in statistics? Oh, yeah. Oh, I've tried to understand it and my head yeah. nearly exploded. Uh, Simpson's paradox happened um, with Test and Trace recently. Um, okay. the, uh, the, there's two, Test and Trace has got two groups of people. It's got the stuff that public, public health, the local public health officials deal with outbreaks and they've got a 90% contact rate. The, um, the call centers deal with just individuals and they've got a, ter they've got a 50, 60% contact rate. Terrible. Um, what happened um, last week is that the overall contact rate, average over everybody, went down, but the contact rate for the um, public health group, local group, went up, and the contact rate for the other group went up. So they both, both groups got better, and overall they went down. Right. And so it's what, because, happened? what happened is that for some reason, there was a big drop in the number of cases that were part of outbreaks and a big rise in the number of cases that were individual cases. So there were more being handled by the people, the call centers, which had a, a poor contact rate. So even though the call centers had been done better, because they'd been handling more cases, the overall contact rate went down. So there was a, 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 it is difficult, it's a real paradox, but it happened last week in test and trace, a real live 
Simpson's paradox. Each individual group got better and overall things got worse. <laughs> I don't know if you understood that, but it was just uh, that's the just best about, I, I think. Yeah, that's the best it's, I um, can do, I'm afraid. Yeah, these are the times we're living in, I think. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Um, I, can I just ask one question before you show your video then? We heard yeah. last week that this COVID vaccine is hopefully 90% oh, yep. effective. Yeah. Um, so how should we be feeling about that? Is it, do you think Ooh. we've got a glimmer of hope? Yeah, we might be I, able I, to leave our houses oh, in 2021? I, I, think so. I, I was very impressed, but really this is, I mean, even it's not that one, although Britain has ordered a lot of that one, it just shows it's possible. And there's okay. you know, loads of, of um, you know, possibilities coming along. It was it's extraordinary, and uh, although they didn't say, you know, they had they they ran, you know, it's, I love clinical trials, and I used to work on Pfizer clinical trials on data monitoring boards, oh. which decide when trials stop. So I knew all about this and looked for the protocol, and um, essentially twenty thousand of people got the injection with the vaccine, twenty thousand people got the injection with a saline solution, but went through the whole vaccination process, and out of those, when they followed them up, it looks like eighty six in the saline group got the virus and eight in the vaccinated group got the virus over the same period of time now that you don't need fancy statistical analysis to say that's pretty damn good and please pass me the vaccine you know that's pretty damn good and uh, I, and I think that's it is extraordinary how how that's happened and um, and there will be others coming along as well uh, so it, it was it was deeply impressive and hugely encouraging because we're going to have a tough winter, um, tens of thousands of deaths, and it's going to be it's going to be really tough. Yeah. But hopefully we can do this again in person one day. Then. Oh yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> I'd love to see this audience. So I just know I'm just I'm, 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 I have clicked on the um, chat just to see all the chats. There's a very nice. Um, very nice comments. Thank you very much indeed for the nice comments. No, we're really grateful should... to have you. So can we see your video? Oh yeah, can I finish? just show you? Let, let me just. Ah, hang on just a moment. Um, uh, let me try you. Let me do this. Um, uh, let me go on to uh, share screen. Make sure the video. Okay, I hope this is going to work. Wow, this is incredible. The total wipeout course. It's, it's beautiful. Look down there. Is that 20 ordinary everyday Brits, including a railway engineer, a poker player and a penguin keeper? I can see waving. Yeah, this is Professor David Spiegelhalter OBE, and he's a professor of risk. What this means is that if I'm going to qualify, I've just got to get below three minutes. Uh, yeah, right. Below three minutes is the key. And off goes the professor towards the nasty snowballs. Yes? Yes? Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, I know what he did there. He followed the y-axis when he should have followed the x. On to Granny's house now, a risky destination. All right, Professor Spiegel Hall. Oh! <laughs> Yeah, he could still be doing this in under three minutes. All he has to do is clear both logs. Ow! Oh, big ow! The gentleman doth profess too much. Despite that risky performance, Professor David Spiegelhalter OBE climbs to the finish in three minutes, 17. Just shy of his target. Now, taking the lead, it's Suspicious Helen, followed by Saxy Fiona and Carolyn from Outer Space. In fourth, it's Ball Crossing No Meat Marina. In seventh, Rob Boy. And scraping it through to the next round are Professor David Spiegelhalter OBE, Ali the Penguin King, and Guinea Pig Mel. <laughs> the 12 remaining competitors must mount the ski lift and do their utmost to remain standing. To help them, they have a podium to perch on and a bar. To finally, it's Professor David Spiegelhalter OBE. What am I doing here? I don't stand a chance. It's snowing! The ski pole arms have started. Oh, and they're off! Now, they will need to jump over both arms, which get raised up as the game goes on. Remember, the last five still hanging will go through to the next round. Oh, Professor Spiegelhalter! I don't stand a chance! All making light work of those ski poles so far. There's Professor Spiegelhalter OBE, Rob Boy. Those poles are getting higher now. There's John. And John again. And James. Oh! They are not letting go! No. There's Mel. Oh no! 
Oh, Mel! Oh! Mel! Hence now, the next two to four will be out of the competition. Marina, suspicious Helen. That's a Spiegelhalter OBE. Oh! 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 oh no! Just presenting himself to that arm man. <laughs> undignified. <laughs> So, Professor Spiegelhalter OBE is the next victim of this first ski lift. Yeah, I was robbed. I was <laughs> how, how sore did you feel after that? I was that? a bit bruised, but not too bad because it's amazing because you're so padded up that you can get hit by this thing and it really flung through the air and it doesn't, it doesn't actually hurt. They must have experimented with this and found out that it worked all right. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, that was my, my, my career high. That was a great achievement. I like that you calculated the, you know, the time and the risk for yourself, though. So. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. No, I did my homework, you know, and I, 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 I took that seriously. You know, I did the st statistical analysis, trained for three minutes, and it worked because it's tough. It's really tough. Very, very hard tiring. Well, David, thank you so much. Um, we, we've had amazing comments and questions and, you know, people are saying this has been brilliant. This is the best stats talk they've ever heard. So we can't thank you <laughs> Actually, enough that for joining doesn't, us. That doesn't say very much. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know. They could have seen loads. This might be the yeah, best out of might be. They might be, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, so for everyone who's still on the call, please join us. Um, we've got great sessions over the rest of the <laughs> week. Um, and at five o'clock today, you can join the entire Shine team at, at, in a hangout. Um, and we're asking people to bring their pets along if they'd like. So um, join us then. Um, and uh, just join me in saying thank you to David. And um, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Yeah, love it. Can I just say, I mean, I'm having a look at the, the comments down the side. And so thank you so much for the nice comments. And it's been a, a real pleasure. I, honestly, what a great audience to talk to. I wish... I wish I could always talk to audiences like this. <laughs> okay, we'll have you back again then. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. Okay, okay thanks great. so much, everyone. Okay. See you later. Thanks, Bye. David. Bye. Bye.